Hi, everyone. Hello, are these on? Hello, I'm Tom, this is Neil, and we're gonna talk about the future of technology, and in Europe in particular. Um, but this is a kind of weird time, because I don't think you can talk about technology in isolation anymore. It feels like we've crossed a line in the last few months where the political implications of what technology companies are creating have become much more important. So I kind of think we have to start there. So what's your take on all of this, Neil, and what, what does it mean for people who are starting companies now? I think uh, that what, what the recent events, I mean, 2016, uh, have, have taught us is that um, there's, a, there's a massive division between people who feel like they've benefited from technology and innovation, globalization, and people who haven't, um, and are hope that technology itself would solve that problem was probably naive. Um, and I think that what this means going forward is that we as an ecosystem, but particularly entrepreneurs um, and the people who, who, who back them, have to be much more mindful about the societal impact of the businesses that they're creating and back businesses that are future-proof, not only from a technology standpoint, but also from a societal standpoint. So I think, um, obviously, it's a, you know, the, the cliche view of this is like, you know, fake news leads to Donald Trump winning. And there's, there's a, you know, that's a piece of it, but there's a, there's a very much bigger set of trends here. The OECD just put out a report where they, they looked at what was the, you know, the biggest factor uh, that was uh, affecting, uh, you know, the stagnation of, of median earnings and people worrying that they were getting left behind. And, uh, you know, people think it's to do with migration. They think it's to do with jobs going to China. But the OECD said that actually technology was a, was a more significant factor than those two things. So that's one part of it. The other thing I think is that technology is sort of entrenching and reflecting uh, this divide and you know there are lots of examples of that too the way that Facebook seems to be able to divide people into separate communities the way that some startups themselves actually uh, embody this division are you an uber driver or an uber rider because you're probably not both of them um, so what does this mean if you're starting a company now how can you how can we use technology to make to, to make it part of the solution and not part of the not part of the problem not making things worse yeah I, I, I think that um, I think that you know there's obviously going to be uh, some sort of necessary distinction between somebody providing a service and somebody consuming the service I mean that's the nature of a service business but that doesn't mean that it's permanent or that it's immutable or that it should be divisive um, and actually I have spoken to a lot of Uber drivers who do use Uber when they travel. Um, so that, te that test, I think, is met. And they're grateful that they can use Uber. And why wouldn't they? It's cheap and it's ubiquitous. And I think that's a really good thing for a business to aspire to. Um, it's not the case in every, uh, in every service. I do think that Deliveroo drivers consume Deliveroo mm -hmm. um, when they're, when they're you know, uh, at home watching a game. Portfolio company, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, disclaimer, sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, but, uh, or Volt drivers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but, but, um, but the other question is, you know, so, and, and, I, and I think that what at least is evolving in my mind is this kind of transitivity test of a business, which is, you know, can the providers of a service afford the service, not just aspire to afford it someday, but can they actually, on a day off, use the service? So that was Henry Ford's big test, which was he wanted to make cars cheap enough so that the people on the production line making the cars could aspire to buy them. Yeah, so that worked. Um, uh, and I think and it gets harder when you talk about physical products, right? I mean, you think about sneakers or, or cell phones or jeans. Um, you know, the, just the difference between the wages and the, and the end price in a different market is so massive that they could never afford those products at the end price, um, at least when you're talking about jeans made in Bangladesh. But, um, but I do think that the businesses are aware of that, and consumers are more and more aware of that. The other question, though, that I find interesting is, you know, are your customers willing to do the work of the provider on the other side of the counter? Would you, know, would you, you know, if you're 20 years younger, 
you know, do that job? Um, you know, would you ride a bike for, for delivery if you were in college or, or, doing, or doing another job? Would you have your kids do that or your friends do that? Or do you feel that, um, you know, it's not something that, uh, that, that you would want them to do because, uh, you, know, you know, you don't like the way the work is structured? Um, and I think, again, a lot of work has to be done in that, in that regard, but I do think the entrepreneurs backing these companies, driving these companies, really care about this stuff. And I think they will figure that out. So we have two big trends at the moment that are changing the nature of work and actually the structure of companies. So one is the sort of gig economy approach, which sort of blows up the, the logic of companies that Ronald Coase set out about reducing transaction costs. You could do that without having to employ people. The other one, obviously, is automation and the latest incarnation of that being machine learning and, um, and so on. Do you think we need to actually... Um, are we going through a time where we're actually redefining what jobs are and what companies are? Because the whole way that society is set up and the whole way that you know, tax systems are set up assumes certain things about employment which don't really seem to be true anymore. And yes, we see that reflected in regulatory battles for Uber, but do you think this is, a, this is an ep epical shift in the nature of what jobs and companies are? Absolutely. I, I think that's undeniable. I think that forward-looking governments, open-minded regulators recognize this, that the wrong reaction is to sort of say, hang on, this doesn't fit within what we've been using for the last 500 years. Um, they know that new frameworks have to be established, new statuses have to be established um, with new exemptions and new exceptions. And um, I think that's happening, but I actually think it's just the beginning. Um, I, I don't want to go too... Uh, futuristic, but there is also the notion of an autonomous corporation um, that you and I have talked about you know, at different times where there's nothing that says that a corporation uh, operating a business has to be owned by humans. It could just be self-owned. And, and self-operating, and uh, yes, we'll, we'll see what happens. But the idea is that even the, self, even the autonomous corporation would still farm out some work to to human, so it would, it would still employ people. Sure, yeah, it would you know, use some Bitcoin to buy an upgrade and say thank you very much and go back to doing what it was doing at zero profit. But I, I think it, it, uh, one of the analogies for what's happening now is what happened in the 19th century. Obviously, the Industrial Revolution was happening. People were very worried about jobs. They used a lot of very similar vocabulary to what people say today. Uh, they talked about the demon of mechanism. They said that you know, workers would be made redundant. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, employment went up as a result of industrialization in a very big way, and it led to the creation of the, the middle class. But we saw a lot of political unrest in the middle of the 19th century as a direct result of the fears that people had about this. And one of the things that happened there was a, um, the, the revolutions of 1848 didn't achieve a great deal in the grand historical sweep of things, but they did move the, the, uh, the cart along the road uh, towards wider participation in democracy. At the time, in a lot of countries in Europe, only land-owning men could vote, and one of the things that people were annoyed about in 1848 was that, and so there was, there was some progress. I wonder what you thought about the potential for uh, not just taking a sort of more politically, um, a broader political view when starting a company, but what do you think about the potential for technology itself to, to shape politics in a good way? Do we need to reboot there as well. Is that an opportunity entrepreneurs should be thinking about? I mean, how will this come about? Who's going to build it if not entrepreneurs? I think that every problem is an opportunity for an entrepreneur, literally. Um, uh, uh, I, I, and I definitely think that technology can play a role there. Um, you know, the, the phrase filter bubble has been mentioned too many times this week, but there's no reason why technology can't be used to bust that. And, um, and that doesn't mean that the alternative is just open you to the world. But I'd be curious to see what an intelligent algorithm could do in terms of connecting me with somebody who's almost like me in many regards, you know, same taste in music, uh, same background, but actually very different from me in one important way. Um, and, 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 and hope that because we share interests and we may even, you know, have our kids in the same school, um, but we disagree on one important thing, we'll, have, we'll begin a dialogue. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing I've been thinking a lot about is uh, you know, uh, and, and Om, Om Malik wrote about this in his, uh, in his New Yorker oh, the, piece. The Empathy Vacuum, that was a yeah. very good piece, yeah. The, the fact that, um, you know, we, we've, we've kind of really uh, drunk the Kool-Aid on turning everything into a remote control experience with our phone. And in doing that, we've kind of eliminated a lot of human contact. Mm. Um, and some of that is a good thing because you maintain consistency 
uh, and you save time. But some of that is not a good thing um, because you know, in those brief moments of exchange, you know, actually you're not just communicating your order, but you're also getting a read on how that person feels about their job and the process. Um, and you might even meet somebody who could be your soulmate or, you know, or, or, or work with your company or, or you could work for their company, right? Um, and we're eliminating all that, all that serendipity uh, from the loop. In fact, the only time you're, you're actually defaulted to a human is when something goes wrong. And so you're predisposed to not like that experience and you're predisposed to like, just get me off this, oh, I have to talk to a human because it's, you know, uh, you know, just Zendesk would be a lot easier. Um, and I think that's probably headed in the wrong direction. And so kind of rehumanizing some of these, uh, some of these loops is another thing that I think technology and, and, and interface design could do. There's also the concern that um, startups, are, that entrepreneurs are maybe, in some cases, focusing on things that are problems that really only exist for people who run startups. The classic kind of, I haven't got time to do my laundry, so I'm going to start a laundry, laundry stuff. That's another kind of bubble, isn't it? It's not a filter bubble, but it's a kind of everyone in the world is like me and has the same problems as me, which isn't true. Yeah. Um, I think people overstate that argument, but I do think it's true sometimes. And then you ask the question, you know, are the people uh, who work for this company interested in using this service? Would they ever consume it? Um, or is it just, you know, as you say, um, uh, you know, for, for a certain uh, niche segment, uh, by a certain niche segment. And then in that case, it's not scalable and it's not, it's, from our perspective, it wouldn't that be that interesting as an investment. Okay. Well, let's, let's look to the future and try and be a bit more optimistic. So one of the things that I think would bring people skills to the fore um, would be a consequence of automation. And as you know, we see this in the past, that when you automate part of a process, um, everyone says, oh no, we're all going to lose our jobs. And people have said that for 200 years. Um, what actually happens is that the other parts of the process that can't be automated become more valuable and the demand for them goes up. And the classic example of this is uh, ATMs. So ATMs actually led to an increase in employment by banks because they meant that you didn't need so many employees in a branch um, to give out cash and so you could open more branches because the cost of opening a branch was lower. Another example would be legal clerks. We thought they would be put out of business by search engines, by you know, smart AI tools. And in practice, what's happened is it's made discovery in legal cases cheaper. So discovery is now encouraged by judges. There's more of it. And now employment on legal, legal clerks is going up. So it's very possible that actually automating boring parts of work will put greater value on the social interaction, all that sort of thing. And that's going to shift the kind of balance of skills that, that people need. Um, but that would require the people doing the automating to kind of expect that and build that into the process, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, 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 and I think they will, not because they're necessarily um, thinking of you know, making room for uh, a displaced kind of uh, workforce. But because it's the best way to get their product out there, it may be the best way to get their product approved by regulators. Um, you know, I think when, when self-driving cars um, start really taking up, uh, taking up uh, uh, market share, um, we're not gonna have from one day to the next the ability to self-drive, you know, to jump in a, in a vehicle anywhere. It'll probably be within restricted parts of cities, um, you know, maybe even, you know, during certain, certain times of day. Um, and, and there'll be some sort of default to a human operator. So there'll be some, not, you know, some network operating center somewhere where you'll have banks of, of drivers you know, looking over five or ten cars. I um, was talking to a startup about just that thing right here yesterday. So, yeah, the other thing I think will happen was with delivery lorries, for example. If you have driverless lorries that are delivering stuff, the, you know, the washing machine is not going to get itself out of the lorry. You're, you're still going to have to have someone who's much more like a concierge or a customer service person. And that's what happened in banking with ATMs, that the, um, the, the, you had fewer bank tellers and you had more people doing customer service, advising people on loans, mortgages. It's a, it's a higher skill, more kind of, you know, personal involvement job. I mean, I mean, what it does require is the willingness to be retrained and redeployed and, you know, change from what you've been doing for 25 years to something else, which, you know, I think is a generational thing. It might be a, an open-mindedness thing. I mean, there are, will be people who won't be willing to do that. 
and they will probably suffer. But I, you know, thankfully, I think that's a minority of the people in the force. I think that that is. I mean, that is such a kind of long-standing goal for technology um, to to deploy technology properly in education. It hasn't happened yet. Um, I think it's really striking that the three big online learning startups, Coursera, Udacity, edX, were all founded by people in AI labs. And if you ask them about it, you ask Sebastian Thrun, you ask Andrew Ng. The reason they say is that they can see what's coming as a result of the technology that they've invented, and they want to do their bit to kind of help and help with retraining. And you know, it's still early days for that stuff, but. I think if there's one opportunity where technology can be used to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem here, um, it's surely it's in online education. Surely there's got to be and, a massive opportunity there. And it kind of it kind of you know begs the question you know if you if you're going to college now, what do you study? Yeah. Right? What what's the most? Um, because it's kind of hard to pinpoint yeah. the technology or the language that's going to be relevant when you graduate. Mm. So what are the skills? Uh, and uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, m muscles that you need to develop to be future-proof when well, you graduate. Well, people call this learning how to learn. And I think one of the interesting things about programmers is that they know that they will have to learn new languages throughout their careers. So they, and, and, and it's like speaking languages. When you've learned three or four, you can learn others quite quickly. So programmers are kind of necessarily always learning on the job because there's always new technologies, there's always new APIs, there's always new languages. So it's not explicit to learning how to code, but one of the things that learning how to code does teach you is that sort of flexibility. And I think that learning how to learn is the thing that we we really need to figure out how to teach more generally. But won't we be coding in natural language anyway? Yeah, maybe we will. I mean, one of the things that machine learning does is, it, you know, changes the nature of programming altogether. It means you don't have to explicitly write so much code. So, uh, yeah. I, I, anyway, that's that's a, a one area of um, of optimism. I think uh, potentially a big, big opportunity if we can get machine learning deployed into education and and, uh, and uh, have it used for retraining. There don't seem to be any examples that I can find that this working really well. There's this startup in Brazil called Geeky, and I, it's unclear to me whether that that really works. But uh, I would sort of focus on that. Do you do you see any other areas where we could deploy technology to be part of the solution, not, not part of the problem. So I, I definitely agree in, in, terms, of, in terms of education. Um, I, uh, I, I, I think that um, we definitely need to figure out ways of connecting people across the divide, not because they feel uh, you know, a civic duty to do so, but because you know, it solves a business purpose or an entertainment purpose. Um, those are the areas that I think, and, I, and then you know, all of the kind of on-demand businesses are actually doing that. Um, the the on-demand businesses are absorbing a huge buffer um, of people. They just need to do it in the context of uh, of, of labor laws that are that are again future-proof, that fit with the the winds of change, and and that are um, sensitive to the way uh, the way these things are being received by the broad population. The the, the common thread that runs through this is not just the retraining, but generally that people in the future are going to have to take a lot more responsibility for their own health care, their own pension, their own maintenance of skills. Things that people who grew up in the 20th century, at least, expected employers to do for them. If you look at the long historical trend, actually, it was a very short window where employers did that for you. It was roughly 1880 to 1980, and we've sort of been through that period, and it's changed the way we think about everything. And we're now coming out into a much less certain, much more flexible um, world, and we have, to be, we have to be flexible enough to do that. Yeah. yeah, and I think, again, a lot of those solutions will be driven by startups. On-demand insurance. Um, uh, you know that that you consume as needed, that you pay for as needed, that are that may be um, passed on to your employer or to the customer for the gig that you're actually doing. Um, and, you know, if you could, a lot of these things have been um, cut up into bits uh, that are of arbitrary length and arbitrary size because that's what worked in the days when calculating this stuff was manual, and you're not going to do it every time but you can literally do that every time now in real time, so you might as well price it that way. I mean, one example is why are salaries paid on a monthly or on a bi-weekly basis? <laughs> We've just gone through this at The Economist where we re we are rebuilding our back-end systems. All of our systems, even for our digital products, are based on issues, weekly issues. And we've realized this is crazy and we need to be like Spotify and charging by the month. Um, it's, of course, it's obvious, but when history has trained you that something is the way things are, it's very, very difficult to unlearn that. So I think sort of learning not just to learn, but learning how to unlearn 
is the other, other piece of the puzzle. Absolutely. Completely agree. Okay, well, I think that's, uh, that's all we've got time for. So, uh, Neil Reimer, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you.